Good morning. Welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to Research as Activism, Studying the Documentary Ecosystem. I'm Maggie Bowman, the Interim Director of Advocacy and Programming here at the IDA. I'm joining you from the unceded ancestral land of the Potawatomi people, also known as Chicago. My pronouns are she and her, and for the blind and low vision members of our audience, I want to offer a visual description of myself. I am a middle-aged white woman with shoulder length brown hair, glasses, and a gray sweater. I am very excited to welcome you to today's conversation a topic that has been percolating for several months. It's been our goal at the IDA to continue the spirit of our conference getting real in the time between conferences. When we gathered last fall, the themes of access, power, and possibility guided our conversations over the course of those five days. Some of you may have, may have been part of those. Today's conversation continues that exploration. How can research help us map power in the documentary industry? And then help us chart a course towards a healthier and more equitable documentary system. I'm very excited to have with us moderating this conversation today, Chi Wei Yang, senior, senior program officer at the Ford Foundation in its Just Films team. And before I turn it over to Chi Wei, I want to thank our supporters for today's program the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, the attend we, we will have 15 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit your questions through using the Q&A tool and, and we'll do our best to sort through them and share them with the moderator. And, um, and he will read those questions aloud to the panelists. Um, also, I'd like to thank our uh, captioner today, Tina Dillon, and our ASL interpreters, Gabe Gomez and Sharon Pierre-Lewis. And now I will turn it over to Chi Wei. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to the IDA and Maggie for making this happen. Uh, it's great to see that we have folks from all around the world joining today. Um, really happy to be facilitating today's panel, Research as Activism, and really pleased that we have such a great group of folks coming from a range of perspectives. Um, again, my name is Chi Wei Young. I am an Asian American man with black glasses, wearing a blue jacket against a white background. And I am zooming in from Lenape land or Brooklyn. Today we'll be talking about what I think often sometimes sounds like a wonky, dusty subject, and that might be the case in some regards. Um, but in many other respects, it's a very dynamic, exciting arena that has significant influence on the documentary field. And helping us talk through some of these questions are four individuals who work and engage with research in very different ways. And I'm very happy to introduce four esteemed field leaders, um, many of whom wear uh, multiple hats. And they include uh, Sonia Childress, who's a senior fellow at the Perspective Fund, um, Katie Boram Chatu, executive director at the Center for Media and Social Impact, who's also a professor at American University School of Communication and the author of a great new book called Story Movements How Documentaries Empower People and Inspire Social Change. We have Lisa Valencia Swenson, who's an Emmy Award winning documentary producer and currently the acting industry programs director at Hot Docs, which is starting very soon. And finally, we have Sahar Driver, who is a, a documentary impact and engage, engagement strategist, also a university educator and researcher, and was commissioned by the Ford Foundation's Just Films team to author the report Beyond Inclusion, the Critical Role of People of Color in the US Documentary Ecosystem. So welcome to our panelists. And um, just a couple notes before we jump in. Um, you know, what do we mean by research? And I think this is one of the questions that we'll get into today and what the stakes are. Um, and there are many ways to define research, who it's for, how it's done, what its intentions are and what it can do. And for the purposes of today, um, 
and you can see my, my cat behind me. Um, for the purposes of today, uh, we're focusing on research uh, and analysis that looks at the documentary field as a political, economic, business, and cultural ecosystem. You know, investigation that is focused on assessing the broader trend lines of how documentary work gets done, who's doing it, where resources come from and go, the numbers, the demographics, what the films do in the world, all these dynamics. And you know, all this to help us better understand the business, personal, relational, institutional, and cultural dynamics at play in documentary, you know, to clarify, to reveal, to validate this. Um, and in the case of today's panelists, toward greater transparency, equity, and sustainability. You know, it's hard to make change without having a baseline of numbers and dynamics to operate from. And as a funder at the Ford Foundation, I can say that you know research matters greatly in the flow of resources, um, and I'll, in the flow of resources. And it's you know sometimes it seems like an invisible infrastructure, um, but the one that has significant influence. You know, research can help set funding priorities. It can help set pol uh, policies. You know, in a world of limited resources, you know it's a key lever to help guide uh, where resources go. It confers value and legitimacy in many ways. And there's many questions that are embedded here, you know, not only what research needs to be done to address the challenges that we face, but, you know, many other questions, you know, how can research be a form of activism, you know, what happens if it's weaponized, what research can be trusted, you know, why does research methodology and design matter. And also, you know, what are some examples of, of research studies that are um, being conducted right now and why do they matter to us. And you know, as the documentary field has grappled with questions of authorship and ethical practice around filmmaking, um, you know, a question might be, how do we port some of those questions over to the field of research? And um, just to end this introduction, I, I took a quote from Linda Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodology, Research and Indigenous People, where she writes about the need to work outside of, you know, dominant research methods and paradigms. You know, she writes, you know, the implications for indigenous research are clear and straightforward. Uh, the survival of peoples, cultures, and languages, the struggle to become self-determining, the need to take back control of our destinies, the acts of reclaiming, reformulating, and reconstituting indigenous cultures and languages have required the mounting of an ambitious research program, one that is very strategic in its purpose and activities and relentless in its pursuit of social justice. So I think a lot of things that we can draw from that um, for this conversation. So with that as a quick intro, I'm really happy to welcome our panelists. It's so good to have you all here today. You are all coming from different positions and institutions and perspectives on research. And I wanted to begin by each, just opening to each of you to just very briefly share with us the role of research in your work. And then we'll dive into some of the larger questions at hand. And I thought I'd start with Sonia Childress, so please. Thank you, Chiwe. Um, it's so great to be with everyone today. Really quickly, uh, I'm Sonia, she, her pronouns, um, black woman, locks, glasses, and a uh, orange and black polka dot sweater. Um, uh, you know, I, I worked for, uh, as an impact producer for 20 years, and I would say the research that I relied on the most had a, a lot to do with the um, efficacy or the impact of the campaigns that I was running. So any kind of research um, and um, reports that I could develop or help uh, commission um, to look at the success of my work or the limitations of my work. Um, I look at a lot of research on cultural strategy um, and communication strategy to help me understand um, what kind of messaging I might attach to a particular impact campaign. So I would say that was a lot of the research that I used in my work. This research, um, what we're talking about looking really at the field is something new and fresh and exciting for me. Um, over to you, Katie. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Katie, um, joining from the ancestral lands of the Piscataway Kanoi and the Anacostans here in DC. And um, visual description, I'm a white woman with light brown hair and a green tunic, um, she, her. I'm so pleased to be here and research as activism is a phrase that I've actually used for 20 years. So I'm really thrilled. I, I told the 
panelists last week on our pre-brief. This is like the panel I've been waiting for my whole life. Um, so very, very briefly, just to respond to Chiwe's opening prompt. So I'm really a trained uh, researcher, an academic who really became a producer and a maker and a strategist over the years. So I've used and facilitated and analyzed research in every job I've had, uh, always at the intersection of media and social change, whether in a foundation or a communication agency, film production, and now I run the Center for Media and Social Impact, which is entirely devoted to research and creative incubation around social justice and media. So, you know, our philosophy really, when it comes to the documentary space in particular, although documentary is not our only focus, but it is probably our most beloved um, focus, We've been devoted really to listening carefully to questions and challenges that actually emerge from the field and really focused on designing and facilitating studies that can provide data to actually help those challenges and to facilitate documentary filmmakers be able to make the stories that they want to make, speaking truth to power, having freedom, uh, economic viability, representation, and so forth. And so really, you know, our guiding philosophy as an organization that does research at this intersection is, you know, the idea that social change communication, as probably many of us know and have talked about ourselves in different words, always requires three elements. They require stories that evoke emotion. Uh, they require, uh, social change requires sustained public engagement and activism. And it also, it requires information and data that can reveal the scope of, of a challenge and opportunity. So our work, is, our work at CMSI is really built within this equation. And over the years in documentary space, we've created and distributed research for activism and issues that include fair use and representation, economic viability of documentary and portrayals of people and stories on their screen. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into it. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And over to you, Lisa. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Valencia Svensson, and I'm coming to you from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, I'm a beige woman with purple glasses and black hair, wearing a purple top and against a off-white wall with some photos on it, and I'm she, her. And uh, I think I'm coming at this more from the activism side of things. Um, uh, I've been tried to be outspoken in the industry for as long as I've been in it around especially issues of race and representation. And I think I was one of the early people who asked the question of who is telling whose stories to whom using whose storytelling methods and why. And now that there's just so many more addendums to that question, it's like, and how much funding are they getting compared to the non uh, underrepresented groups and how much advertising focus are they getting? Uh, there's so many more additions to that question now and how many execs from underrepresented groups are there all along the way supporting their project. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so at the moment, I'm part of two groups. One is called Beyond Inclusion, which is an, a US uh, loose grouping of people, also advisor to the Racial Equity Media Collective up in Canada. Um, Beyond Inclusion has a ecosystem-wide lens. We're really pushing for changes throughout the industry, which I'll describe more later. Um, we had a most recent focus on PBS. We had an open letter to them. The Racial Equity Media Collective is currently um, in the process of having uh, an in-depth uh, study with data gathering up here in Canada going on looking at BIPOC participation in the Canadian film and TV industries. Um, so I'm more the activist realizing that when you have some solid data, you can just have that much more powerful of a voice with your ask. Thank you. And finally over to Sahar. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sahar. I use she, her pronouns and I am uh, currently in Chechenyo and Ohlone lands in Oakland, California. Um, I'm, I have long, uh, wavy brown hair and brown eyes with Middle Eastern features, and I'm wearing a light gray sweater uh, and hoop earrings um, against the blurred background. Um, and uh, I, as Chiwe mentioned in my intro, recently um, uh, conducted research for four just films uh, relating to the state of independent documentary um, 
and uh, people of color in the industry and um, also do uh, work as a faculty advisor to student research. I've been similar to Sonia, I've been using um, research to inform uh, my understanding of um, the landscape in which certain films land um, and to understand the impact of the work that I do um, supporting um, impact and engagement with film. Um, thank you all and welcome. So, so let's dig in, you know, and let's start with the, with a broad question, but one that I think doesn't necessarily have a simple answer. And that is, you know, what is research? What is it for? And whom is it for? You know, and there's many different types of research uh, that originates at different from different types of institutions. It could come from an academic research institute. It could come from philanthropy. It could come from the grassroots. You know, it could be qualitative. It could be quantitative. It could, you know, um, it could be you know, a peer reviewed journal article, it could be a landscape scan, it could be a survey. There's lots of different types of research um, studying different types of things. And so I, what I wanted to do was is to have folks give, you know, offer a few thoughts on um, from where they stand, you know, what research is and how it is um, and who, it, who it's for. And Katie, I wanna start with you. Um, you know, you're coming from a larger academic research institution and, um, and you're authoring uh, research that is, you know, quite rigorous. It's framed within an academic context. Um, and give us a sense for your sense, for an overview of, of of the different categories of research, and then we can um, jump to other folks. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chiwe, and I appreciate the question very much. I actually think it's a really substantive one. Um, we should sort of never assume that everyone's on the same page with any one of us about how we think about this. So. I want to offer first, and I, um, by the way, this participants list is very intimidating. <laughs> if my fellow panelists have looked at it, I feel like maybe I shouldn't have looked because I just got very nervous. Um, but uh, I, I want to say from the outset that the work that I do personally as a researcher and as an, a book author and the work that CMSI does as an institution, we very much use social science and humanitarian, uh, I'm sorry, humanities orientation. So, and we do both quantitative and qualitative research. But what I thought might be useful actually to respond to this question is just to level set a little bit um, in terms of the, the kinds of documentary research that can play a role in strategy and activist intervention. So really like not just research writ large, but what are the kinds of research programs that we have both designed because they were in response to a question that could help documentary makers in some way, uh, and really questions that are designed to turn into research programs are what I call actionable opportunities, right, where you can pick out pieces of the data, individual items that actually become a rallying point um, for activism or whatever the structural changes. So um, we always think about this in terms of what the major question is, what's the research method that accomplishes that question? Because of course, as the uh, other researchers on the group know and in the participants list know, no one research method uh, can answer all the questions. And this is a really important place actually to start. Um, and who will use the data for what purposes? And so in my years of doing this work, we sort of see that these underlying questions that seem to be pretty persistent in documentary work are around um, maybe four different areas. So understanding funding and revenue streams, which platforms, distribution plans, et cetera. Um, the ability to make stories that speak truth to power in ways that are ethical. So that's fair use, filmmaker practices, ethics, um, accountability work, like the kind that Sonia is working on. Um, representation and disparity in the industry, so real professional standards, and then content and portraits of life that audiences experience on screen. So just to level set again. Um, so in general, from a kind of social change intervention point of view, I really see primary research areas in three main bodies. And this, uh, of course, is not completely exhaustive, but um, just to kind of orient for everyone on this on this Zoom. So there are number one, content-based studies. And so those can be something called content analysis, which is quantitative, uh, depending on your field of discipline, or case study analysis. So in other words, these don't ask any humans for information, but are really looking at what exists on screen, which is really important for us to do in documentary in lots of different ways. So um, there's some examples that I think that we'll follow up and send you all, but we've done a lot of these. 
Um, we actually were very proud of the fact that we did uh, the very first diversity data that has existed in documentary. We started it in 2014 um, to look at race and gender composition of credited producers and directors in Academy films and then have followed with a series of studies over time. So that's uh, a different kind of question. And then uh, the sort of second type are what I would call professional experience studies. These are um, human subjects research projects. They can be large scale industry scans of lived experience. So they can be quantitative with surveys. They can be qualitative with interviews, um, focus groups. And these require interaction with humans, of course, to understand their professional practices. And the kinds of answers those provide are things like, what are the lived experiences of filmmakers and professionals in terms of their economics, funding, platform, um, perspectives about their work? How do their lived experiences differ by particular demographic characteristics, which I know we're gonna dig into a lot. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about our state of the field study, but we also have done other research around um, risk, uh, dangerous documentaries is a study many people know. And then a third kind of area of research would be what we would call audience effects and experience studies or community engagement studies as well. So these are human subjects research studies, again, like surveys, in-depth interviews, and these answer questions like, how do viewers understand and respond to watching a documentary? What do they learn and feel and experience after watching? What might they think about doing differently after, after viewing and how do civil society organizations and communities work with documentaries. And there are many different ways to do this kind of research, but I thought it would be um, possibly useful to kind of drill down into those three areas because they're often confused out uh, in the world, not just speaking of the documentary ecology, but content studies very different from studies where we examine humans. And of course, um, all of them can be qualitative and quantitative depending on the question that you want to ask. So uh, that's the a, a sort of range. And uh, for those who really want to geek out on this, I have about four examples of each one of those types that exist in our research body that I think IDA will send out after this call. So if you want to sort of connect those with the particular research questions, we're real happy to share that. Thank you, Katie. And you know, Sonia, Lisa, and Sahar, you know, you've all engaged with, with research in, in different capacities wearing different hats. And this question of who is research for, I'm wondering if, if you might be able to offer some of your thoughts on that. Because I think you know who it's directed toward is, is a very important piece of this. And Sahar, you know, you're part of an organization called Research Action Design. And um, I'm curious if you might you know, speak from that perspective as well as your own as a researcher about this question of who it's for, because I think that that you know, there's many audiences, but then there might be multiple audiences for research as well. Yeah, um, Research Action Design is a um, organization, a collective that um, prioritizes research justice, which is a framework that understands that um, and, and uh, centers um, the, the uh, understanding and experience and expertise of communities um, about the issues that affect their lives. And so, um, I've worked with them to help facilitate a process that um, supports participatory research um, that brings that kind of authority into the research design process, which means that it um, it's both the process of, of doing the research is em emancipatory and, and liberatory in that like you get to advance what the question, research questions are that you uh, think are most important. You get to analyze as a collective and as a group um, what that data means, and you get to advance the solutions based on that information uh, and, and um, make recommendations to, for your own healing process, for your own social change advocacy, um, and also for how you communicate to the world um, You know what it is that um, uh, your community is experiencing. And so uh, with, with RAD, that's the short for Research Action Design, we um, created, uh, I, we worked with SC Justice Group, which is a, um, a collective of women with incarcerated loved ones um, and helped to facilitate this process to understand what the impact of incarceration was beyond um, uh, the incarcerated individuals themselves, um, but really broadly for the community. And it was important because what the process, uh, it, it enlisted a lot of things like an understanding of um, 
uh, the psychological trauma that incarceration was having on individuals and their health, uh, the financial burden and erosion of economic agency, but it also created a, a category uh, and, and a way of understanding that harm, which was political, a, a new framework for understanding called political isolation, um, which is that, it, that, that uh, mass incarceration erodes the uh, political power of communities and, and women with incarcerated loved ones. And that was something new that hadn't really been talked about yet. So a new way of talking about um, the problem of mass incarceration, which could only have come from uh, a research process that was designed and led by people who were experiencing that themselves. So that's just another example. Mm. Thank you. And Sonia and Lisa, you know, both of you actually wear multiple hats, both, and you've operated both at like the community-based grassroots level at the sort of field institutional level and also at gatekeeping levels within, you know, festivals and, and, and pitches and, and philanthropy. And I'm curious, you know, from those different perspectives, um, you know, how have you seen research uh, directed and who the audiences have been for those research projects that you've engaged with either as participants or as, you know, or as um, authors um, from the different uh, positions that you've been in? And Sonia, maybe I can throw that over to you. Sure. I mean, um, yeah, you know, so I, I mean, you know, how I, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about this question about research and, and part of it is because of, you know, someone who's like spent 20 years as an impact producer, I've been, that 20 years was really focused um, to a certain degree on the filmmaker but m much more focused on the people at the center of the films and the communities that are frequently the focus of films. And um, I think because I'm so focused uh, on the impact of films on those people, um, I I'm sort of obsessed. <laughs> I've been sort of obsessed um, in, in my career as an impact producer and now in this fellowship that I'm in um, that sits within a, a foundation. And I'm sort of obsessed with these questions about um, the individual and the collective impact of documentary film on historically marginalized groups. And that leads me to ask a lot of questions about ethics and power and transparency and accountability, um, both in the practice and in the field. There's one piece of research that really um, uh, spoke to a lot of what I was seeing as an impact producer and now can do something with um, in, in my fellowship role, which is actually uh, another study that came out of uh, Katie's um, entity. Um, but when Pat Ofterheide was there and Pat Ofterheide's 2009 study, Honest Truths, which really looked at how documentary filmmakers navigate ethical questions in the field. And I had been so obsessed with questions of ethics, the ethics of this form the ethics of the industry within the industry, the ethical norms of how filmmakers approach their practice. And that helped me think about last year, the fact that, you know, filmmaking, documentary filmmaking has no guardrails, um, ethical guardrails. It has no framework for what is um, uh, an, an extractive form of filmmaking and what is a community centered form of filmmaking. So that piece of research has really um, spurred me to think about um, a gap in the field that could emanate where the solutions to that gap and the interventions around that gap could actually emanate from practitioners. And so I'm in the middle of a, a process right now with some colleagues mm -hmm. around the field to develop a new framework for ethical, um, non-extractive, uh, transparent and accountable documentary filmmaking. So in that way, um, you know, there are so many questions I've had that now I feel like that we're in a moment where research can really help to answer those questions and that can guide new interventions. And right now I'm, I'm focused on interventions in the field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I mean, that, that type of research around ethics is really, I mean, you can see how that is quite relevant for many different individuals, obviously for practitioners, for filmmakers, for the protagonists, for funders who are thinking about where they're putting their, their resources and, and why they should be prioritizing some over others, right? Film, There's many yeah, different festival curation. I mean, across the board, this question of ethics. Yeah, I mean, this one discrete study and the intervention that's coming out of it is just going to, it, it's going to have a fingerprint on every part of our ecosystem. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. I would just say I, I like my research like I like my documentaries, that they're designed or informed by impacted people. That that's that's how I lean. <laughs> Thank you. I, I wanted to add to that. I tend to 
sometimes think very meta. And I remember when I was producing films and we were thinking through impact campaigns and even the funding of films, I realized that there was a global us and them. And often they were the subjects of the film and the communities in which we, the filmmakers and the audiences wanted to have an impact. And I realized why, why is this all being framed this way? Why is the audience that we're targeting with the film and for the impact work, not the affected communities themselves first? And once you drill down on that and you see how we frame everything, it's remarkable the degree to which we frame things as we are doing this for them. And so I think that the research, this can also be applied to research. And I think that when research is done from the point of view is what do we, we need, when you're doing the research from that community, that affected community, underrepresented community, BIPOC communities, whoever, what do we need to, to further empower ourselves to continue to push for the change we've always been pushing for the entire time? I think there's a real lack of understanding that a lot of underrepresented communities have been pushing for a change from the first days that they started to be underrepresented, whether that might have been over 500 years ago. And so we're not doing anything new. And we're often overlooking the fact that there's we're contributing to centuries of expertise that's already there. So I often ask what research will empower people and what that same research will it ask the rest of us or them, whoever is in a position of power in that particular factor, I guess, identity, will it ask the rest of us or them to act in solidarity with those who are getting empowered? And if I ask that question of the films I produce, and I now ask that question of research that's being done, is it being done to empower those communities because it's being done from those communities? And is it being done to ask the rest of us to act in solidarity with those communities if we are not part of those communities? So that's my overall thought of who research should be for. It's very meta. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And you know, just listening to all of you talk, you know, there's many different roles that research has. It can, it can empower, it can validate, it can reveal, it can clarify, it can do all those at the same time. It can point to commonly held truths and, and, and offer data to back that up. It can also reveal new findings um, and, and, and show us new ways of looking at the world as well, right? So there's many different functions of that. And, you know, in thinking about this question, not only of, you know, what is research and who, who is it for, you know, is, is a follow-up question, which is, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities of research, you know, and going back to the, you know, what I think Lisa, what you brought up is, you know, what kind of ethics and accountability do we want to have for uh, the research that is done and that it is a very powerful mechanism. And I wanted to sort of open this up for, for the group and, and open the, this up. In, in a few minutes, we're gonna dive deeper into a couple of examples of, of active uh, research projects and ones that have moved the dial. But before we get to that, I wanted to, chat a little bit about some of these challenges embedded within research, you know, and the opportunities, you know, and these questions, you know, how can research be a form of activism? You know, Lisa, you mentioned it can empower and it can reveal, you know, um, truths, but I um, want to see if we can dig a bit more into that. And then also, you know, when we were speaking earlier, you know, one, one conversation point that came up was, you know, how research could be weaponized or how it could do damage as well, right? There's, I think there's, it can cut both ways if it's either used in the wrong way or done in the wrong way as well. And this goes to the methodology, but also the ethics of how it's conducted. And this larger question of, you know, what research can you trust and use at the same time? And so before we get into some of these case studies, I wanted to open it up to the group and ask about, you know, what are some of these problems, challenges and opportunities for research? And Lisa, I'm wondering if I, if I could go back to you to kick this off, to offer your thoughts on this question and then open to the group. Absolutely. Well, certainly uh, the conversations I've been having with uh, my fellow members in Beyond Inclusion, we realize we're, we're, we're becoming very ambitious and we're jumping way past who's in front of and behind the camera especially who's behind the camera. We're jumping to how much funding did the people behind the camera, even if they're BIPOC or people with disabilities get in relation to their able-bodied or white counterparts? How many of the executives at each of those organizations related to our film uh, are, are white, people of color, are queer, trans, are women, et cetera? Um, what's the spend? What's the spend over that entire organization? The production companies, for example, that the large streamers hire to make the bulk of content and that's where the bulk of money is spent. How many of those production companies are white led? Um, how many of the decision makers at the streamers are white or 
people, you know, able-bodied people, et cetera, et cetera, down all the lines. Um, we are moving into that stage. You know, we noticed with um, our recent letter to PBS, it did focus on how much uh, resource gets allocated to Ken Burns. Not that we're focused exclusively on him. He's representative of a structural uh, situation. We noticed that the Hemingway series that recently aired, it had advertising literally on Bank of America bank statements in a New Yorker exclusive cartoon in a Jeopardy category. So which, what of our content is getting that amount of advertising focus? That's also a key part of it. Um, so we want research, we're hungry for research data reports that show the, the hidden truths, that show the structural and systemic access to power or barriers to it, who has the access to resources, um, what are the dynamics at play in the field, who is doing the publicizing, who is doing the reviewing, on and on and on. Um, otherwise, data can often mass truths. In our letter to PBS, we asked for things, very clear things. You can go to bipocmakers.com to see our four questions. They were data questions. I won't take the time now. We got back a wishy-washy response. And when we're not clear about what data is saying, people will throw out wishy-washy responses thinking they're responding. Uh, Paula Kerger of, of PBS said, 55% of documentary hours featured BIPOC talent or were produced by diverse fame filmmakers or covered topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. That doesn't say a thing. <laughs> that does not say how many BIPOC makers were behind the lens. Um, as she also wrote, for the past five years, on average, nearly 22% of documentary films on PBS were produced by BIPOC creators. But how about all the other factual content on PBS? How about the full lineup? Prime time, daytime, everything. Um, and then what, last one, here's a favorite. Uh, PBS has created a more diverse workforce. 39% of our team identify as BIPOC, which levels of the team. <laughs> so we want, we want to get nitty gritty um, and, not, and, and very thorough and very high level and very ecosystem wide. Um, the other thing I think is that having whatever we're studying. So in the case of race, it would be BIPOC researchers taking the lead on the work or else taking the lead on shaping the work uh, is absolutely crucial because we know we know day in day out what we want to have changed and we know what research and reports and data we want to have to back us up we know the gut feeling we need the research and data to, to back our gut feeling um, and the last thing i would want to say is that i have been an in the trenches underpaid documentary producer for years i'm now in a salaried position my understanding is that all of us on the panel are um, forgive me if I've misunderstood something there, but I definitely would say that those of us who are salaried in this industry always need to take the lead of those in the trenches, often underworked and over, uh, overworked and underpaid filmmakers and producers. They know what they need most and we stand in service to them. So there's my big spiel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. You know, and I think that, you know, you make a really good point that, you know, research can be used as an, as an accountability mechanism, right? You can demand research and, and that can be used to, to create accountability with more powerful entities, in this case with, with PBS. And, and Katie, you know, you're in a very different position where you are authoring and, and designing research that is doing exactly this, right? And you're able to, to, to work both design from within your team and also collaborate with the field to think about the research that is needed. And I'm wondering if you might give us um, your perspective on what are some of those challenges that are that lie within doing research that that is rigorous and accountable that says the right things and you know to one of Lisa's points that you know data can be used in lots of different ways right you can interpret things you can frame things so that they say multiple things and so part of putting out research and designing is to is to accommodate that right and think through the methodology so that it, it says clearly what 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 you intended to say is how it is received. Um, by, by your reader. I'm wondering if you might give us a, a few thoughts on some of those challenges that, that you face in designing the, the methodology for your research. Yeah, um, thank you for that. And uh, I, I really appreciated, I appreciated everything that Lisa just said. And I wanted to plus one the, the sort of idea that those of us that feel like knock on wood, we have sort of stable employment. Um, taking on um, big juicy questions. A lot of times we take on research projects that we know would be uncomfortable for filmmakers to do because they're literally trying to sell a film to Netflix or whatever, and we're not. So we're real happy. To, 
if Netflix is on, we're not intentionally trying to make you mad, but we're happy to take on those heated questions to give sort of cover to filmmakers who can't have those inconvenient things. So I just wanted to plus one that, and it's a position that we think about overtly. We're working on a research project right now. <clears throat> I think probably some of our working group is on, is on this call, but it's, um, actually with great gratitude funded by Chi Wei's program at the Ford Foundation, but it's a global study that looks at the future of grassroots distribution and streaming for social impact for documentaries around the world because we understand that this is becoming a practice that is not seen as convenient uh, if organizations primarily think of film as only a product of the entertainment marketplace and how that gets in the way of community engagement work that is such a deeply, deeply held value and ethos in documentary work. So um, anyway, that's a long winded way of bolstering Lisa's point to say that um, a lot of people, uh, respondents have wanted to be anonymous on that project because of the risk to them of being public around it. And that's, uh, we just deeply um, take seriously that role. So I just wanted to add that, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, forgive me, I might get geeky really quickly, but there are a lot of really, really serious considerations when designing research and representation, of course, is certainly one of them. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, there are other considerations I want to add, because Lisa's made that point so eloquently, but um, there's so much behind the scenes that happens in designing research protocol that um, you would never want to read about because it sounds terribly boring to read about, but if you read the peer reviewed journal article study of the thing, you might have to read about it. But I just wanna offer a sort of smattering of those because I think it's really important that if we as a community are also refining our, for lack of a better term, sort of media literacy on research that we think is important, um, then I think that we probably need to think about what we know about how it's baked, right? And so just to give you all a couple of different examples and with apologies for the other um, hardcore researchers on this call who know this really well, but um, you know, when we do any kind of human subjects research at a university setting, we have to be trained to do that. We actually have a trained certifi certification system called CITI, C -I -T -I, um, that we have to pass through every two years and it's quite rigorous. It takes many hours to go through this training and it's all about human subjects protocol. And it deals with things that you all might imagine to be obvious, like who, but, but maybe they're not obvious, right? There are very strict protocols for who accesses who's private and personally identifiable information, who captures that data, who's able to access it, who's able to reveal the identity of those people. For example, the state of the field study, which I might have time to talk uh, with this group about. Um, we strip even ISP information. It is completely confidential and anonymous. There are issues like informed consent there are issues like do no harm in human subjects research. If you're asking, for example, mental health type questions, you should not be doing that without training um, because of the potential harm to human subjects. There's also issues of, um, that are re certainly related to representation, but there are issues of bias. Um, and so one of the things that we do in, in really solid survey research is we use validated tested survey questions from other literature and other scholars as much as we possibly can. Um, and in that way, the research is iterative. When we're doing things like content analysis, which is the visual coding of who is in a story, et cetera, we do things like have multiple coders and a statistical test called intercoder reliability to ensure that any one person is not seeing things 30 different ways through um, the lens only of their own individual experience. And um, the composition of the research teams, of course. And we, uh, we take uh, good care to think very carefully about the composition of our research teams. We're primarily a, a women and person of color led organization. And um, every different research team has a different composition depending on the question and depending on the skill of the researchers as methodologists as well. So um, sorry that got geeky really quickly, but this is sort of part of my own little soapbox moment to say the ethics of doing research, particularly when it comes to human subjects research should be very, very stringent. 
And we should be paying attention to details like that. Representation, um, also the, um, well, everything that I just mentioned, I'm trying to see if I had anything else. Um, and, you know, fully informed consent in advance for all participants that they know everything about what's going to happen to them and their data. So I, I offer this just to, to not to say that there's plenty of use, university level research that only goes into journals and nobody can access it. And, and we do, we, we put out public facing research and we also do peer reviewed stuff. But it's important for me to say that we approach all of it as if it will be peer reviewed, because that's what peer review actually means, which is a very careful look at the methodology and the possible harm to participants. So bias, representation, so on and so forth. So I think that's a nod for um, high level research quality. And I think not particularly because of, because this should be true for all kinds of research, but if we are using research to make change and structural change in our field, we need to believe in it. And we need to believe that it was done with the highest ethical and methodological standards. Thank you. And, you know, I want to bring it over to Sahar and Sonia, just to add your thoughts on this question of some of the challenges and opportunities uh, for research, but also, you know, your, your thoughts on, you know, how, you know, how can grassroots and small organizations engage with research at the same time, if, if they don't necessarily have the same type of capacity or, or training that, you know, a, a major research outfit does as well. I think that there's uh, other ways to engage with telling the story, telling a story, to build power and build visibility as well. Um, but Sonia Sara, do you have any thoughts you want to add to that? Uh, well, well, I can I can just problematize research briefly, and maybe Sahar, you can you can talk about um, opportunities. I mean, not not to be the skeptic in the room, but you know, I, I think about. Um, I am really deeply excited about this moment that we're in. You know, the documentary film industry kind of runs on a sense of benevolence that we are, as Lisa said, doing good and just, you know, by the questions that we ask, by the fact that we're looking at certain groups, um, by the fact that our hearts feel good about the work that we do. We, um, that, but we leave our work unexamined and in this increasingly market-driven uh, media landscape, um, there are forces and actors there that are very intentionally opaque. Um, and so I think there are real challenges to, um, there are cultural challenges to understanding the, the impact of our work. And there are now real structural challenges um, to un understanding the impact of our work. And I, I think there's real danger in a field that doesn't, doesn't uh, rigorously look at itself. And I, I think there's real danger also just when social scientists position themselves as objective um, uh, researchers in the way that I think there's danger when filmmakers uh, um, position themselves as objective to the questions that they're asking, um, objective witnesses. And you know, I think about you know when I, when I hear social science, I think like 1965 Moynihan report. I think about a liberal uh, democratic administration in this country commissioning a report to look at black poverty and essentially uh, extrapolating from this data that black poverty is pathological. Um, you know, the, 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 it, this was a report that was, came from benevolence, came from an attempt to fix a problem. And there is, there danger rests in the design, but also in the analysis, especially when research is not emanating from the community whom, for whom it most will impact. So, you know, questions of like, are we asking questions like Lisa said that will really point to systemic problems or are we asking superficial questions that are gonna allow superficial fixes to endemic problems? You know, Are we correctly extrapolating from the data that we see um, in order to suggest some systemic remedies? Um, are the questions and the designs really informed by the people who will be impacted most by the data? Um, and, and can we find empirical data, which we all really need? We have anecdotal evidence. We know in our lived experience what the field uh, where equity um, is broken in the field, but we need empirical data. Can we get that data with, while acknowledging none of us are really completely objective in seeking out and using that data? So those are, I think, you know, where I find some complications and some dangers in, in the work that we're leaning into. 
Yeah, I, I would uh, very similarly uh, only underscore the, the uh, importance of uh, transparency. Like if, if we're talking about a smaller scale study um, and we all understand that uh, objectivity is a myth uh, to one degree or another, then being really transparent about the um, position uh, that, that a researcher holds and um, you know, really investigating uh, the assumptions that uh, are guiding the research becomes a really valuable and important way that, um, uh, of at least beginning to, to underscore tra a more transparent process. Thank you for that. And you know, with, with that as a, as a broader setup, I think we're gonna to move to a next section of the panel, which is to have each of our panelists share a bit about a current research project that they're working on. And I think for this, it'd be great if you know, folks can give us a top level of what it is, um, what some of the goals are, and if there are you know, some, of, what are the change goals that the research is designed for, and perhaps some details on the methodology or design of the research itself, as we've been talking about to, to think about those questions of ethics, accountability, et cetera. And, and we'll use this as an opportunity to, to drill down and think about how some of these questions are, are live within um, current research um, studies. And um, Katie, I wanted to move back over to you to, to kick us off because you know, you're about to launch your updated state of the documentary field report. And can, can you give us some top findings as well as some, some details about how you approached it and how you addressed some of these larger thornier question, questions around research in the process of doing this, this study? Sure. Um, you know, I feel like I'm making a game time decision because this conversation is so rich and I have these slides, but I think I'll just verbally go through the overview and let everyone know because I don't want to steal time from my fellow panelists because um, with 10 slides that can happen. Um, so let me just verbally give the, the story and then I'll send you all the link um, to the study. So the story, let me just tell you very briefly. Okay, we each have five minutes, right, Chi Wei? Okay, this is a good game time decision. I'm just letting everyone know. Um, so, uh, so the state of the field study, um, for those who don't know it, is a project that we started in collaboration with um, IDA. Actually, IDA reached out to us. And anyway, this was, right before the first getting or the second getting real um convening so that was in 2016 so technically we started this project in 2015 we kind of had this conversation and said you know at at other moments of incredible transformation and revolution other media fields have had sort of a state of the fill in the blank kind of study the music industry had this at the time of its greatest disruption other studies um and so we thought, you know, it might be important to start to track the lived experiences of documentary filmmakers and documentary film professionals, not just makers, but those of us who work in uh, different components and are not just making films. Um, so that is the story of the state of the field study. So we conducted it for the first time in 2016. And the questions were deeply informed by the field, the very original questions um, from many different filmmaker organizations and collectives. And then of course we you know, worked really hard to work on the questions to make sure they're not double barreled and you know, asking 20 different things and so on and so forth. And so it's actually quite a meaty study now. We conducted it in 2016 and 2018. And then in 2020, we were about to launch the study, again, the data collection part when the pandemic hit, like literally we were a week away. And so for very obvious reasons, we thought that data collection in the midst of a pandemic was not a good idea for this study. So um, for this study uh, this year, we did gather the data beginning in August of 2020. We did feel it was important to not skip the study altogether if this is designed to be somewhat of a barometer of how things are going. And um, uh, forgive me for not, not mentioning this up close. The study is a, a massive survey. It is about 45 different um, content-based questions and a whole series of other uh, demographic and life questions. Um, designed to, to understand documentary industry members' perspectives and lived experiences around economics, motivations, representation, funding, and changing platforms as they evolve over the streaming media age. 
And um, because this research is iterative in uh, what I think of as the best possible way, which means we learn a great deal about where the differences and the different findings pop up, um, we learned through analyzing the research that the greatest differentiators in lived experiences pop up, generally speaking, around uh, race and ethnicity questions, will not surprise anyone, but also around gender. And so this year, if we did a couple of things. I'm just previewing where this is going. This year, we expanded the study to be international. So it is now an international study. We had something like, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, the number of um, other countries that participated, more than 900 respondents around the world. In the United States, we had a little more than 600 respondents, which is quite robust. And almost 400 of those identify primarily as directors and producers, which allowed us to ask deeper questions about the revenue information about an individual film, because directors and producers are the ones that generally hold that information. So what we're releasing today, and I'll put the link in here for you all, is um, a key findings version of this. So this is 15 key findings. It's still about 50 pages. And the full, full study, which is part one international, part two US based, we'll be releasing that in May. And I just wanna warn you in advance, it's about 200 pages, but because the study is actually really designed for people to use the data for structural advocacy purposes, We'll also be offering all of the individual graphs for a full open download for anyone in the community or press who wants to use that. And so it's just taking us a little bit of time to get that done. And thank you all for your patience. Uh, 200 individual graphs is uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. Um, and so let me give you the overview. Uh, and the one other thing that's new for this year, in the last two waves of this study, we always presented the sort of full findings and then where we could see in the analysis that there were actually differences around gender or around race, BIPOC and white, we reported those as well. This year, we're reporting those breakdowns for every single finding. So every single finding, I'm, I'm giving you all a sort of guide for how to look at this. Every single finding has the um, all respondents survey response and then a breakdown for gender and then a breakdown for um, BIPOC and white. And we had about 45, participating organizations, documentary organizations in the US that help to ensure participation from the field and a much larger number than that around the world. So the 15 key findings uh, for US, I'm gonna give you verbal takeaways. And then again, um, we have a slide deck that we'll send you all as well as the report. So um, economic challenges, uh, keep takeaways really, really briefly. Economic challenges continue to be the greatest challenges facing the doc uh, industry. This won't surprise anyone. So only a small proportion of documentary filmmakers make a full living from documentary work. About 75% have to do other work to make a living. About two in 10 documentary filmmakers, about 20% made enough money to cover production costs and make a profit. Um, Three quarters of documentary film professionals, that's a full 74%, were negatively impacted dramatically by uh, the pandemic. So that was obviously a question that we asked for the first time this year. Um, BIPOC and women identifying filmmakers are the most economically disadvantaged across the board in terms of film in income, revenue, and access to bigger money from streaming networks. Uh, another quick uh, overview, and I just have a few of these, and then I will turn it back to Chi Wei. Um, overall, there's an interesting story here around um, BIPOC filmmakers on many different levels. Um, BIPOC filmmakers attest to the importance of philanthropic foundations and public TV for their funding, film-based revenue and distribution, more likely to make nonfiction films, but much less likely than white makers to get film funding, documentary revenue, and personal income from streaming networks. Um, and BIPOC filmmakers much less likely than their white counterparts, um, their white peers to have made any revenue at all from their last documentary. And so that comes out pretty clearly um, from the data. So again, offering the graphs to everyone to use in your own documents or however you'd like to use that. And then gender is also a meaningful differentiator in a couple of different categories. So um, male identifying filmmakers are more likely to make documentary income from streaming networks and from series than women. 
women are much less likely than maker than male identifying makers to have made any revenue at all from their most recent doc. And here's a piece that is is pretty important, I think. And this is um, these these um, big overviews are several different variables pulled together to tell a concrete story. And so you all will see this written out exactly like this in the report. But this is this next one I think is pretty important and maybe deserves its own sort of focused intervention in terms of what to do with information like this. But documentary multi-part series seem to be um, pretty big business and still a lot of participants in this survey, many ND people are just not seeing, they're not seeing the opportunity from that. They're not seeing the revenue. Um, so these respondents see commissioned work from streamers and other networks as the greatest economic opportunity for the future and yet least likely to be accessing that. So this is something I talked to Marcia Smith at Firelight about this idea a couple of months ago and it's interesting to see it show up so clearly in the data. So in other words, a small handful of players is making these lucrative multi-part documentary series deals. Um, and then uh, let me see. Oh, let me let me end with um, a hopeful note because we like to do both hope and opportunity and challenges. And I, I know that will seem flip, and I don't mean it to be. But we asked a number of questions about documentary filmmaker motivations, and these questions actually come from studies also about um, investigative journalism, which has had a lot of research done on like what motivates investigative journalists. So um, the majority of documentary filmmakers, at least in this study, are compelled to tell nonfiction stories, not only because they're entertainment stories, but because they're striving to make a meaningful difference um, in urgent social issues. And here again, this is where we see women and women identifying and BIPOC filmmakers kind of at the highest level of believing that their storytelling is designed as some form of intervention and not just entertainment. So. Um, there's lots in the uh, in the study, and again, we prepared this sort of um, 15 key findings just to pull out sort of what seemed to be the most salient points and give you something digestible to read. And then uh, I think everyone who participates in this study will will um, have access to the full. We'll know when the full study comes out. And one other thing I just want to add here in the in the vein of iterative and researchers working together and things like that. There's um, really brilliant work coming out of the UK from a researcher named Steve Presence, who I think is probably on this call. And he's done a great job doing a kind of field-wide study like this and directly evolving it into advocacy steps in a way that um, seems really compelling. And so we have collaborated a bit on some of our research questions and some of our survey questions. And so you'll see all of that cited in the full report. So I think, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. I apologize. I did in fact go over time. So you can only imagine how bad it would be if I had the slides. Thank you, Katie. And we just scratched the surface, but there's a lot of really, really important information in this report. And I know that we're all looking forward to digging into it. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to Sahar. And before I do so, you know, we are, for everyone, we're gonna have a few minutes for questions. So start thinking about those and please drop them into the question chat um, if you have them. But Sahar, you know, the Beyond Inclusion Report, I think is, 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 I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the methodology, the approach, and the intentions for for uh, for the study. It's a it's a slightly different type of research um, approach. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, the report was. Um, I mean, I think in terms of uh, starting off with transparency, you know, we began with an, with a few assumptions. One, it's that independent storytelling is really important for a healthy documentary ecosystem. Um, that it's really important that um, for a healthy documentary ecosystem that the storytelling and storytellers be by and for people who look like our country, not just for a narrow and racially overrepresented subsection of it. Um, and we assumed that um, that this the voices and leadership of people of color matter not only to the nonfiction landscape but to society at large. And it's you know so th that was the starting point of where we began this research. Um, and uh, and from that place, then um, uh, we I started to look at sort of the history um, and present state of activities that um, organizations that are supporting 
filmmakers of color, like what are they doing? How are they organized? Um, what do they need to continue doing what they do um, in order to kind of make meaning of the moment that we're currently in? Uh, and uh, the research was uh, based, it was not at the scale of the kind of research that Katie does, although I drew heavily on a lot of the research that CMSI and Katie has done. So thank you for that, Katie. Um, it, it really helped to create a narrative bed and a context for which this other research could sit. Um, but um, it was based on 21 semi-structured and open-ended formal interviews. And that means that I asked the same questions to each interviewee, but I allowed them to take the conversation where they felt it needed to go. Um, uh, it was also um, informed by dozens of informal conversations. Um, I conducted online research of over 200 organizations um, and investigated to, to kind of understand who and what was out there. Um, and Altogether, um, the cumulative sort of story that uh, it told was a, 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 a offering a broad sense of the barriers that filmmakers of color have been experiencing, of course, uh, which, of which we've been talking about this and on this call, but um, also the stakes for society if these are these issues are not addressed, um, and uh, it also uh, uncovered how important and strong uh, that, that strong and resource organizations have been for enabling filmmakers of color to pursue their work and, um, and really kind of articulating the, a moment that we're in wherein there is a tremendous amount of activity uh, and both of new, newer organizations that have emerged in the last five to seven years to address some of those barriers and, and point to solutions, as well as longer, like longer term organizations that have been doing this work for decades. Um, and how critical it is to continue to support that work to, to really um, resource it, um, uplift it and strengthen it so that there's a, uh, an infrastructure in place that can allow those filmmakers to continue to do the work that they wanna do over time. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there was a number of like, uh, you know, smaller kind of findings that emerged through it, having not smaller so much, but uh, points that um, within this about the importance of um, strengthening anchor institutions and in different communities that are outside of um, uh, major uh, metro areas or major uh, media centers, I should say. Um, the importance of film festivals, um, particularly those that are POC led in um, not only supporting the work of the artists, but being distribution vehicles for getting the, their work out into communities uh, and in, to, to their communities in particular. Um, and uh, a number of other things like this, but ultimately uh, it also, I think what, you know, in terms of the importance of uh, kind of doing this kind of work uh, and this kind of uh, research is to uncover the other questions that we need to be looking at and uh, other research that is needed. And we've seen that um, through, through this report, we've seen that um, we need more research into the kind of um, uh, support that those organizations need to continue to sustain. Uh, and we also need more research about where funding is going, um, like what the differences are between uh, how much funding is going towards POC led organizations versus how much uh, money is going towards white led organizations. So those are just a few examples of, um, of what the what this research was about. Um, I hope I answered your question, Chi Wei. No, that's really wonderful. And I, I think you also make a point where, you know, the, once research is out in the world, it's live, it, it shifts dynamics, it points to additional research and there's sort of like a, a cycle there, right? It does the work, points back to additional work that needs to be done as well. And I, I wanted to move over to Sonia and if you could tell us a bit about the, um, the Lens Reflected Research uh, initiative that you are uh, collaborating on, maybe a bit about its intention uh, and design. Sure, thanks. Um... So um, uh, last spring, when when things were really you know top of mind in terms of disruption in the field and uh, a, a reckoning around uh, structural inequity, um, there was a conversations that were going on online, in particular in the Global Impact Producer Assembly List Serve. This is a community of impact producers, um, the kind of impact geeks, your impact geek cousins in the field. Um, and, you know, conversations were, you know, conversations around in structural inequity came into that space. And this is about 400 
impact producers around uh, around the world. And these were conversations around who's telling whose stories and, and you know, conversations that were being asked across the field. And I think it, in that particular conversation thread, there was a thread about, you know, what is our responsibility as impact producers, as people who service and work films and, and bring the work of filmmakers out into communities and knit them into social justice movements. You know, what is our responsibility of lifting up certain stories um, and supporting the work of certain storytellers and how is our work as impact producers supporting or maybe undermining the narrative sovereignty of marginalized, historically marginalized communities? You know, what, what were we doing? Uh, what was our role in this conversation? And um, Ani Mercedes, who's an impact producer and runs a, an impact organization called Looky Look Pictures, um, said, uh, you know, I really want to know who is telling whose stories. This isn't a rhetorical question. Do we have any data on this? And Katie put her um, <laughs> put her cape on and jumped in. And I, you know, put my glasses on and jumped in. And we said, you know, it's incredible that we actually have no data on this core question um, in our field, that we have no transparency around this. We all seem to think we know the answer to that question. Um, but to have no data to back it up and have no data to inform any kind of structural interventions. And this is a, a moment of structural intervention. Um, so we began to offline a conversation about designing a study and trying to see if we could get some, um, you know, the, the heft of Katie's uh, research arm um, and some resources to, to launch a, a comprehensive study. And we were happy and lucky to get some resources from um, Chiwe's program at Ford uh, with the Perspective Fund and with MacArthur to initiate this you know, first of its kind study um, that looks specifically and squarely at this question of representation. And um, just briefly, the, the study we're looking at um, will now examine and, and we hope to reveal the racial and gender identification of all directors and main protagonists, so not just the principal protagonists, but main protagonists for all documentaries that are distributed in the streaming era of documentary filmmaking. We consider the streaming era to be to start in 2014 when streamers began to acquire and uh, produce their own nonfiction. So we start at 2014 and we're going to look uh, from 2014 to 2020. And we're looking across um, six uh, entities. So we're looking at <clears throat> the top networks really that distribute nonfiction storytelling. So we're looking at two streamers, Hulu and Netflix, um, two public media uh, distributors, Independent Lens and POV. I'm, uh, I'm gonna, um, I, I recognize we have ASL translation. So I wanna uh, speak slowly and cable, two cable entities, HBO uh, documentary films and CNN. Um, and as we, you know, we've been spending some months working with Katie and her team to um, <clears throat> develop and design this study. You know, Ani and I are not social scientists, um, but this data absolutely informs our work. Um, and so we are advising every part of the study and, and we're designing the, the release of this study and how this study will fall into the hands of um, advocates who are trying to shift um, uh, structural inequity in the field. And Katie <clears throat> and her six person, very diverse coding team are really leading the research. So this is really exciting for me. I've never been able to collaborate on a research study that directly impacts my work and could have profound ramifications on the field. Um, and in terms of the kind of questions that we're, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm really curious about, um, you know, I want to reveal, you know, what specifically are, you know, are there um, racialized and gendered barriers to the, the road to the director's chair? Um, you know, are there discrepancies between communities that are overrepresented as film subjects and underrepresented as film directors? Um, and what I'm mostly excited about is this question about the discrepancy between diverse representation and authorship. You know, as Lisa said, you ask questions about who's telling whose stories or what stories are we receiving from these uh, outlets. And a lot of times the response is, look at all of the colorful programming. 
um, they're, they're answering a question about authorship with an answer that speaks to representation. Um, we can see lots of stories represented. We're asking about who has access to tell the story. The power really, I would argue, is in authorship and not in representation. So I'm really interested in visibilizing the difference between the two and um, pointing um, to where there are, should be structural interventions to ensure um, programs that bring more people of color into the field are not simply, um, are actually resulting in getting that work um, funded and distributed. And that, um, and that program and that demands for diverse representation are not simply met with more money for the same kind of historically enabled filmmakers to tell stories about everyone else's experience. So I'm interested in, in developing, in terms of wh what I hope this um, study will inform are really evidence-based solutions to equity issues rather than symbolic gestures or superficial interventions. Um, I, I wanna ensure and kind of compel gatekeeping entities to bring more rigor and transparency to their tracking and to their data collection um, and compel them to make that research available to the field. Um, that goes from public television to the streamers, to cable entities, to private philanthropy and um, equity investors. Um, I, you know, I wanna shift the field towards greater internal examination and accountability. That's, that's what's live for me personally. Um, and, and then I think I wanna shift equity interventions to questions around uh, funding and distribution and not simply in pipeline programs that bring people into the field. Um, but don't, but have so many barriers to um, that stop them from actually making a living or getting their work seen. So these are really um, the, 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 the questions that we're asking and the ways that we think that this data, um, once it's in the world, as so many interventions are happening on the grassroots and institutional levels, that we hope this data will inform. Thank you, Sonia, that's great. It's so useful to hear about that, really exciting. And before we move into um, some audience questions, I want to turn it over to, to Lisa. And if you wanna share a bit about your part of the Racial Equity Media Collective in Canada, and you wanna give us a few details on um, the kind of thinking and research that it's engaging with. Yes, um, very briefly, I'm one of the advisors, so I, I'm so not in the weeds. And so I'm gonna give a just top level overview. Basically, the, the group came together over a year and a half ago now and decided that, uh, well, it was fortunate to get some funding to, to uh, do a, a research project gathering data on participation of BIPOC in the Canadian film and TV sectors. Um, and they hired a, a, an established firm doing this type of work in Canada to do this. Um, you know, Interestingly, uh, there are some important differences between Canada and the US and a, a number of our attendees are um, to this panel are not in the US and not in Canada either. We have more federal funding systems and policies in place. We have human rights legislation that helps us do the work. At the same time, we also have more concerns around privacy than in the US. So it's harder to gather data, race-based or otherwise. Um, so there's a lot of details to the work. Um, however, over Overall, the biggest finding was that most of our government funding agencies um, and other agencies have just not been collecting the data. So really the grand purpose of this study it is gonna to be to show that you need to start collecting the data. <laughs> so that's, that's sort of an end result of that. Um, the three main asks that REMC has is that race-based data be collected, um, that there also be equity oversight in government agencies so that there are senior people paid, salaried, who are inside and that are responsible for really making sure there is a robust equity rollout. And then that when communities decide what the target, that there should be targets, let's say you want to have a bit of a quota or whatever for a while to try to level up the playing field, um, that those targets should very much be set by community. Uh, it's going back to points that Sonia has made earlier. Anyway, I um, anyone wanting more information should definitely get in touch with the Racial Equity Media Collective because uh, the three people, Shireen, Amar, and Tamara, who are working tirelessly, have a lot more details than I do. So I hope I've done them justice. Thank you. And, you know, as, as we can see from each of these examples, a broad range of types of inquiries, of audiences, and, and approaches. And, and, and I'll say that, you know, one arena that we don't have represented today is, is you know, a smaller um, um, 
nonprofit organizations that are doing research based upon their own work for the constituents, which is you know, which I think is is a different type of research, um, which we could talk about separately. Um, but we're going to move over to a few questions. We've been getting a number of questions um, in the chat. And I wanted to start with a question from Lena. And she asks, you know, most of the impact related research that she's come across seems to focus on independent films. Would you recommend any resources or research covering uh, TV broadcast and um, SVOD commissions? Uh, it's going to see if folks might want to address that question. So this is going into the commissioned and the um, more the commercial side as well. Yeah, Lisa. Yes, big time, huge time, beyond inclusion, which is, it's interesting, a lot of us are clearly done with the inclusion paradigm because the Ford report that Sahar Yu authored is called Beyond Inclusion and unbeknownst, uh, when the group that I'm part of formed, we decided we were also beyond inclusion. So just to clarify that confusing detail for people, uh, we are very much eager to dive in to that big money going from streamers to production companies, who's at the streamers, who's making decisions, who's at the production companies, who are, who's making decisions there. Once you start looking, it's a little terrifying when you realize the amount of financial and human resource going into that and how much of it is not in the hands of underrepresented groups. Um, Katie, Sonia, Sahar, you want to add to this? question. We can also um, move over to a, a second question. This comes from Matt. Um, you know, what lessons have been learned about, you know, offering pathways for the audiences of films to take action that often arrives at the end of the content? You know, what works and what doesn't? Are there go-to solutions for this? And so, you know, this is a question around audience engagement, around impact around you know, uh, call to action. And um, I know that there's been a number of research studies that, that have you know, documented and have tried to understand you know, um, how documentaries move the dial in, in, a, in a short term sort of action way. But um, I want to turn this over to our, our panelists if you have any thoughts about research studies or, uh, or work that has tried to assess this. I can let, go ahead, Sonia. I was just going to say there's the I would you know, there are so many different ways to answer that question depending on what a film is doing and what the issues are that it's addressing but a really great place to start is to look at all the case studies that have been written about um, film impacting and engagement campaigns there's a, a whole clearinghouse of them at the back of the impact um, field guide and uh, the doc society puts together um, so that's where I would point as a starting point. Uh, may I add again? Um, I think the, the key question I said at the start, I'll, I'll repeat it because it's so big in my mind is, which audience is the film trying to engage? And when you start to realize what films have been made primarily for the, the audience, like the community that's whose story is being told versus films that have been made for someone else to hopefully care about that community it's, it's quite fascinating. And when you look at impact campaigns that have been designed to empower the community versus impact campaigns that are asking everyone else to help, it's fascinating. So that would be something I think worth studying. That doesn't, I don't hear get talked about enough. Can I add to that? You know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, um, you know, many filmmakers who receive or, and um, are, receive resources to run impact campaigns for their films, you know, at this point, you know, much of the um, resources to study the impact of campaigns, uh, one, that have really short timeframes, short windows that you're looking at the efficacy of a particular campaign, even though the campaign might be trying to address or speak to a really endemic social issue which is not going to be resolved six months post broadcast um you know as much as we might like um so you know you know i'm always interested in really um you know longitudinal um studies not only that look at the impact of one particular film on kind of you know shifting the dial or activating new people or raising new money or building new connections or whatever films can contribute to but really thinking about we've looked at you know, we, you know, the nonfiction field has resourced 15 films that look at mass incarceration over the last 10 years. 
what is the particular role nonfiction film has played in shifting um, uh, an appetite for reform or abolition measures? What, what does nonfiction, you know, what, has, what have organizations that are invested in criminal justice reform understand now about the role of nonfiction or how have they used nonfiction over time to, to, to make a case for their work? Whatever it is, I would love to see uh, for those listening whoever cares, like a longitudinal study of multiple films, but really looking at the role that nonfiction plays um, on specific issues over time, multiple projects. I, that's what I'm really excited and hoping someone will, will pull off. Katie, you wanna to add to this one? Well, I feel like a jerk, but I just put, I just put in the chat that I wrote a book on this. So um, it's not the direct answer to your question, but I did interview a lot of people like Sonia. Uh, Sonia is also acknowledged in the book. Um, yeah, no, in all seriousness, I did write this book that was just published called Story Movements, How Documentaries Empower People and Inspire Social Change. And it also grounds a lot of what we're talking about in the research about how these structures and ethos and motivations uh, came to be. And so hopefully there's useful research in there uh, for the field to use. It's not written to be, you know, tactical. And I don't believe like my fellow panelists have said, I say over and over in the book, this is not like paint by numbers. It's not how documentary works. Uh, it's not public health intervention, um, but there's a lot of uh, things that we can know from theories and move and social movement studies and things that really tell us why documentaries are so meaningful. So I did just plug the book. Sorry. And I want to plug it too. It's such a fantastic volume. And I think that what it, what's really great about it is that it goes into the nuance of each case. It is not by the numbers, but each 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 film really has a very tailored approach and is building knowledge collectively uh, through the field on how to do this work. And I think the book does a great job of detailing that out so that the, the work continue to, to sort of evolve and, and build. Um, from, uh, from from what people have learned. So um, so definitely plug. We have two last questions that we want to address before we wrap. Um, one is from Elodie, which is, you know, in, with regard to formal interviews, um, how are those who are interviewed within, say, an, an organization determined? Uh, how, do you, how do you choose who you interview within an organization? And are there metrics that determine whether those interviewed speak to the breadth of experience that occurs within that organization? You know, how does one person represent an institutional voice? Um, and um, so why don't we stay with that? Um, I think that's the question. How do you choose who to, who to speak to? That's an awesome question. Do uh, I just happen to have my mic off. Should I say something since my mic folks and my mic is on? Uh, yeah, I love that question. It's such an important question. We really geek out on in-depth interviews over here. And I know um, Sahara's work is so beautiful in this respect as well. Um, gosh, running a beautiful interview is so much like documentary work. I think that filmmakers know how that feels when you feel like you're in real space with someone. But um, it really, it should, I think who to interview should never be a straightforward question or answer. It depends entirely on not only power dynamics, but what the research question is, what the study is designed to do. So we have a couple of different studies that we, I think IDA will send out afterwards that we did in conjunction with uh, Working Films, which I think many people know Working Films. And um, they were running a couple of different programs that were working with civil society organizations on the ground that were learning how to use documentaries for the first time to engage in their, in their work. And uh, the answer to that question was different for every organization, depending on how the organization saw it, right? So it was very much informed by the community's feeling about who would hold the information. It was not always uh, the executive director. So I think that might be part of the uh, part of what's inherent in that question is uh, the person with the highest title or whatever is not always the person that you want to interview. So I think it very much depends on uh, a couple of different um, uh, variables. So I, you know, I don't, I, I, I maybe I think Sahara probably has an answer to this one too. But the most important thing that I wanted to say was that it's never just a that's never an answer that should be the same for every project. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. And I will say that for the Beyond Inclusion report, um, that wasn't the people that we interviewed were not selected to be representatives of their organizations by any stretch of the imagination. They were um, selected for expertise that they hold or an understanding or a line of sight that they hold that we felt was an important one to um, interrogate and, and kind of understand, but um, not, not as a representative of a particular organization. I just want to add one quick point. All of this is so crucial and I will be using all of this data and research so much. And I also find myself wondering, how do we capture the real moment of impact when I, and this is literally true, when I watched Almaya Tail Feathers narrative film, The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, and I finally feel at a very deep level represented because I'm a woman of color, I've escaped uh, the threat of death at the hands of an ex-partner, and that's what's depicted in the film. And I see myself represented because I literally did. And how do we get at that? Because the impact of that film and the importance of that film was so tremendous for me personally and for probably many, many people. And these are things that we are not feeling comfortable yet to talk about. So I, I challenge us all to think of all of this in that light, that there's a lot of very, very private moments of trauma, et cetera, that many of us are going through. And this is why we're so motivated. And how do we build that into our work? Thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So important. And I think that we actually have have uh, we've we reached our time limit. And I think that that might be a, a great provocation, Lisa, for us to send us out with, because there are many things which uh, we can measure. Other things which we may not be able to measure, or we can aspire to. And this notion of, of consciousness, or or presence, or um, th these these things which are very internal are, are really I think important um, to hold on to. They're they're uh, a very concrete but also intangible aspect. Of, of documentary filmmaking and of cinema and culture, right? And I think that they're also the case for why we need to um, uh, be supporting uh, arts and culture even beyond um, those things which we can measure, you know? And funders need to be supporting work and outcomes that cannot be measured as well. Um, but there's a lot more to talk about. And I think, you know, we've posted a number of research studies within in the, in, within that chat, and I hope that these can be great resources for everyone. And, and who knows, we might have to come back for our round two of this conversation. There's a lot more to unpack. Um, but I want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Katie, Sahara, Sonia, and Lisa. It's been a really great uh, conversation. Um, we're, we're looking forward to continuing this in many you know, corridors and Zooms and other arenas of the documentary field. Um, I think that each of the work that you're doing is going to be activating conversations um, in their own uh, pathways, which is very exciting. And want to thank you and thank all the attendees for, for coming in today, for joining us from lots of different parts of the world. And I want to kick it back to Maggie Bowman with the idea to close this out. Thank you, Chi Wei. You've got 300 people to listen to us talk about research for an hour and a half. <laughs> thank you. I think my, my video is not off, but that's okay. Uh, I just want to say thank you all. Here it goes. Thank you all so much. Um, what an incredible audience uh, representation. I just was really moved to see so many people from around the world as well. Um, and thank you for, for joining. Thank you to our um, captioner, Tina Dillon, our ASL interpreters, Gabe Gomez and Sharon Pierre-Lewis. This was a dense conversation to caption and translate, so thank you. Um, and I just wanna give a shout out our next panel. Um, my colleagues in the um, grants department will be hosting a very exciting panel on Wednesday, May 2nd, um, which is, uh, it's going to be announced all the details tomorrow. Uh, it's called Documentaries Challenging White Supremacy, and it's going to include NPR film critic Eric Deggins and IDA funds director Po C. Tang and grantees John Cesare Goff and Hilary Pierce of uh, the films After Sherman and At the Ready, respectively. So they will share their perspectives on using nonfiction storytelling to explore and challenge white supremacist structures in the US. And once again, the details and the RSVPs for that will open tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Uh, and yes, we will have to come back to continue this conversation. Thank you.